Since 1992, DW Fern mic preamps, equalizers, and compressors have been used in some of the world's best studios and in private use in home studios around the world. This tutorial will help you get the most from your DW Fern products, learn what each control does, and see the best setup starting points for a variety of recording situations. Learn how to interface our products with the rest of your studio gear. Take a peek inside and see how our products are made and learn from Doug Fern's experience in over 40 years in pro audio. Also, there are many microphones out there that require 48 volt phantom power to operate, condenser microphones and some ribbon microphones as well. And in order to provide that functionality, we have a 48 volt power switch here, one for each channel. There's one over here for the A channel, one over here for the B channel. When you turn that on, it applies the 48 volt phantom power, which goes through the mic line to the microphone and provides power for operating the microphone's internal electronics. The next controls that, that will be used um, fairly routinely uh, are the input control and the phase control. The input control adjusts whether or not the signal will be going straight into the microphone preamplifier without any other conditioning before it gets to the input transformer. And that would be the zero position on the control. If you switch it to the minus 20 position, it inserts a resistive pad right on the input before the input transformer to allow the VT2 to accommodate higher levels than normal. Now it's really interesting that when you switch in that pad, of course the level's going to drop 20 dB and you might be operating, if it was on zero, you might be operating with the attenuation control down here very low. When you switch it to minus 20, you're going to need to bring it up quite a bit higher in order to get the same level. Now the VT2 itself doesn't really change its sound between one extreme and the other of its, of its attenuation control setting, but some microphones react differently when they're going straight into an input transformer or when they're seeing a resistive load that's provided by that 20 dB pad. So sometimes the sound changes subtly. Some microphones it's more obvious than others, but oftentimes you will hear a difference. We can't say whether it's better or worse, it's just different. Uh, so our recommendation is when you need to reduce the level, first reduce it at the microphone. Most condenser microphones have a built-in pad which will drop the level down by 10 dB, some of them 20 dB, some have a couple of positions, and you can reduce the level at the microphone. And we re recommend changing it there first. And if that still isn't enough reduction in level, then you can use the minus 20 position on your VT2. The third position on the input control is labeled low Z. And this was a de design idea that um, was incorporated so that you could use very low output impedance microphones. Now, the standard for microphones says that the source impedance, what the microphone looks like to the mic preamp, should be 150 ohms. That's the standard. That's been established for many, many years for very good technical reasons, and that standardization um, makes all microphones interact with our mic preamplifiers the same way, presuming that the microphone preamplifier input impedance has been designed properly. Now, a properly designed microphone preamplifier should have an input impedance that it, it presents to the microphone of 1500 ohms. So we're loading the microphone with an impedance that's 10 times its source impedance. That's the standard, and that's the way microphones are supposed to be designed. That's the load they're most happy looking into. You may see some mic preamps have adjustable input impedance, which will change the sound of the microphone. We chose not to do that because we're relying on the fact that professional microphone manufacturers should build their microphones to the standards, and therefore the VT2 should provide the right load for them. However, there are a bunch of microphones out there, and they're predominantly the newer um, solid-state condenser microphones that have a transformerless output, which have a lower than normal output impedance. And in order to properly match them, we have a resistive circuit on the input which um, matches those better. 
So a microphone that's 50 ohms or 75 ohms or 80 ohms or some other non-standard low impedance like that will often sound much better when you switch it to this low Z position. Now what happens if your microphone is both low Z and also has too high an output level? Well first use the pad on the mic, but if that's still not enough, you can go to the minus 20 position here. The load impedance won't be perfect for the um, low impedance mic, but we found that generally speaking, it won't change the sound of it significantly. So low Z for the microphones that require it, minus 20 if it needs a pad, zero for most of the other microphones you'll be using if you don't need that extra attenuation, minus 20 if you do. The remaining control on the VT2 is labeled phase, and this is labeled that way because that's the way most consoles are labeled, either with the word phase or the symbol for phase, which is a zero with a backward slash through it. And what this does is actually reverse the polarity of the microphone. Ideally, this would be labeled polarity, but we labeled it phase to be consistent with the way the industry um, labels things. And it has two positions. One's called normal and one's called reverse. And in the normal position, a positive going signal into the microphone will produce a positive going signal on the output of the VT2. In other words, the input and output will be in phase. If you switch it to reverse, then that positive going input from the microphone will create a negative going output of the VT2. Well, why is that important and why, what would you use that for? Most of the time it won't make a whole lot of difference particularly in a single miking situation um, because your ears are relatively insensitive to that absolute phase. However, there is a theoretical advantage to maintaining that phase relationship all the way from the original sound to the loudspeaker. I think the chances of that actually occurring in the real world are probably pretty slim. You probably have a 50-50 chance at any given time that the input positive going signal from the microphone is causing an outward excursion of the speaker cone or the headphone diaphragm uh, for the final listener. But presumably, if everything was done properly, the sound would be more natural and be a better um, replication of the original sound if it were truly in phase. So uh, in that case, you would normally have this on the normal position. However, let's presume that you have a situation where you have two mics and they're both picking up some of the same sound. There's some leakage between them. Oftentimes, you can make a significant difference in the amount of isolation between those mics by switching it to reverse. And what you're doing is um, reversing the, the polarity or phase of, of one of the microphones, which will tend to cause more cancellation. Now that could be good or it could be bad. You just have to flip it and see. There's also situations where you're doing stereo miking, where you are going to be using a pair of microphones uh, together in stereo, and you need to absolutely maintain the phase relationship between them. And it's possible with a defective cable that was wired backwards or even a manufacturing defect in the microphone that those two microphones could be out of phase. Normally in stereo you would use two matched microphones, at least the same model. Um, but sometimes you can't. Sometimes you use two different microphones and that works well too. And in that case, it's a possibility that they'll be out of phase with each other. And in that situation, you can switch it to reverse and um, correct that problem. Not a control you use a whole lot, but it's there when you need it. Well, we know a little bit now about how we set it up as far as the level is concerned, whether we need to use the zero position, the minus 20 position, or the low Z position. But what about the overall level that we're going to send to our recorder? Used to be in the days of analog when you were sending this signal to a tape machine, most probably, the indication that you showed on the VU meter on the VT2 corresponded pretty well with the dynamic range of the, the tape. So if you were peaking with uh, the, the signal level so that it was approaching zero, but hopefully didn't go above zero very much, that would be the optimum level uh, for the recorder. That would put the optimum level on the tape and maintain the best signal to noise ratio and 
and uh, utilize the dynamic range of, of the recorder to its, to its fullest. In these days with digital recording, we have a different situation. With tape, if the level gets too high, it might not necessarily sound bad. It can go quite a bit above the zero level on the meter and still sound fine on the tape. In fact, some people like that sound because you start to generate, again, a lot of those even order harmonics because tape has many of the same characteristics as vacuum tubes do. But in the digital realm, we have a different problem because we have a finite ceiling over which we cannot exceed in level or else we essentially run out of numbers and the sound becomes essentially unlistenable. So it's very important in digital recording, as I'm sure you're all aware, to, to keep below that uh, absolute uh, maximum level of, of zero. And many converters sound better a few dB down from that maximum level due to probably some inadequate design in their analog stages. So it's important, regardless of what it says on the VU meter on, on your VT2, to take a look also at the recording level going into your digital recorder to make sure that that's not exceeding the level because the VT2 has the capability of putting out extremely high levels and those transient peaks will be passed through quite a bit without much alteration except for the harmonic addition to it on the peaks and that can easily overload your um, converter in, in your digital recorder. So it's important to not only see what kind of level you have on the meter, but also on the VT2, but also look at the level on your recorder to make sure that you're in a safe range on that as well. That said, of course, you can always overdrive this to some extent. Uh, a lot of the, of the, of the musicality uh, types of distortion that are generated the VT2 happen in the input stages, which is before this control. So you're mainly controlling that by the input pad pads on the mic, mic placement, mic choice, all those kinds of things. Those are the kinds of things that are going to affect that kind of fullness and musicality or even fatness of the signal. But you can gain some additional harmonic content by running this higher, which may be pinning your meter, uh, in which case you might want to turn that meter off to avoid damage to it. And also look very carefully at your digital recording level to make sure you're not going into uh, getting into a problem there. After a while, you'll get experience in interpreting what the level indication of the VU meter is in, in, in correspondence to the proper level on your digital recorder.